Just hey, I'm sorry, that's fine. Most of the talk will focus on exciton diffusion. Um, this is basically um, how far the exciton will move over time um, because of Brownian motion before it decays. And it's not quite true, but it can be approximated in the ideal sense uh, as going as a square root of diffusivity times the lifetime of the exciton. Um, it's typically around five nanometers for most polymer systems that we'll be talking about. And the exciton diffusion length can actually be measured through an experiment where we look at uh, photoluminescence quenching on either a non-quenching substrate like glass or a quenching substrate uh, like anything that can accept an electron from the exciton. And the idea is we shine light on the material, we form excitons everywhere. Some of those excitons will diffuse to the interface with the quencher. And if that quencher um, can accept electrons from the excitons, then the excitons will split there and they won't emit light. Uh, versus if you put it on glass, those uh, excitons can't transfer electrons to glass and they will always emit. And so by changing the thickness of that film on top, we can compare the emission, the emission from both cases and with some math and some modeling back out what the exciton diffusion length is. So it's important, note, it's important to note that the most efficient polymers used in these solar cells typically have very low photoluminescence efficiencies. Uh, meaning if you shine light on a pure film, uh, the number of photons emitted by the film as the excitons recombine is much less uh, than the number of photons that you shine on the film. And that is indicative of a non-radiative non -radiative recombination process that's competing with a, with a radiative recombination process. Uh, as I've shown here, um, if you look at the rates of the different processes, this one here would be the ideal radi radiative recombination rate. This is the rate of some uh, non-radiative recombination process. And if we look at the total lifetime of the exciton, because of these two recombination processes that are competing, we'd get this red curve here, uh, which is much shorter lifetime than the ideal uh, natural lifetime of the exciton, the amount of time it would take for it emitted light and rec recombined on its own. Now, because the exciton diffusion length goes as the square of the lifetime, or the square root of the lifetime, um, we can see that if somehow we could return turn off this non-radiative process, increasing the lifetime to the natural lifetime of the exciton, we'd be able to increase the diffusion length of the exciton. Um, and that'll be important for these solar cells because, um, well, when we, when we think of the solar cells, we think of a stack of materials. And the first thing that comes to mind, of course, is a bilayer cell, um, where we have the donor on one side and the acceptor on the other. Um, this is not actually very efficient because all, the only excitons we can harvest at this heterojunction interface are the ones that are within a diffusion length from that interface. Um, and as I mentioned before, the diffusion length is typically five nanometers, which means there's not very much material here that's going to contribute to photocurrent. Um, furthermore, in this architecture, all the charge that is transported to the material is separated. So all the electrons are in the acceptor side, all the holes are on the donor side. Um, and as we separate those electrons, we have space charge build up. There's all, you know, there's electrons here and holes here that, op that opposes the applied electric field. So the solution to this process is the bulk heterojunction, which will be uh, basically what I'm talking about for the rest of the talk. In this structure, the donor and acceptor are blended and phase separate on a nanoscale so that the, um, any excitons formed in the donor, for instance, will be within, ideally, a diffusion length from an acceptor molecule. Um, and similarly, um, all the electrons and holes are spread out through the device. So the space charge problem is not there, and also we can harvest a lot more of the excitons that are formed because they're all within the diffusion length of an interface. So a typical polymer solar cell architecture is shown here. Um, these are all very thin layers, first of all, and that's going to be important. But we have a whole collector on top, it's transparent, it's the same stuff that you have on your LCD screen, it's called indium tin oxide. Um, it's modified with a work function modifier, P.PSS, it's a doped polymer. It's not really important uh, to know anything beyond that. The active material is that bulk heterojunction I was talking about before, the polymer and the acceptor, um, which in most cases is a fullerene molecule. And then there's a metal <coughs> electron which collects electrodes. Uh, sorry, a metal electrode which collects electrons. And it's also a reflective contact. So what happens is the light comes in through the top here. Some of it gets absorbed in these transparent conducting electrodes because they're not quite transparent. Nothing is quite ideal. Um, most of it gets absorbed in this active layer, and then 
uh, most of the light will bounce off the metal electrode and come back out and be absorbed in the way out as well in those layers. Um, so that's basically the background information. Now I'll talk about this measurement uh, I mentioned earlier about internal quantum efficiency, which I'll refer to as IQE in the future. Um, so IQE is an important measurement because it isolates the, well, first of all, it is the ratio of charges extracted from the device per photons absorbed in the active materials in the device. And it's really important because it characterizes all the electrical, the electrical characteristics of the device independently of the optical characteristics because we're normalizing by the absorption. Um, and I've also written this charges extracted as the external quantum efficiency, which is the same same sort of idea is the ratio of charges collected to the number of photons incident in the device. So when I mention EQE, that'll be uh, including the absorption characteristics. When I mention IQE, it's the solar cell's electrical characteristics only. And the IQE is very useful because there are a number of reasons that a solar cell might not produce very much current. Like for one, it could be very thin and not absorb very much light, but the electrical characteristics could be perfect. Um, so it's nice to be able to separate those out. And again, only the this is a measure of how well the solar cell is performing compared to how well it could perform. So only the photons absorbed in the active material are important here. Now it turns out uh, IQE can also identify some unique and novel effects that are int of interest to people in literature recently, including multiple exciton generation and single exciton fission processes, both of which can turn uh, single excitons into multiple excitons through some quantum interactions. Um, and the interesting thing about this is that you can actually get greater than 100% IQE because, uh, because you turn one single exciton to two triplet excitons, you can pull out two charge carriers for every one photon absorbed. And you'd be interested in seeing a spectrum like this where you get uh, a transition once you get to twice the energy of the material um, where you get 200% internal quantum efficiency. Um, so ideally, because we're normalizing by the absorption the IQE should be wavelength independent. Um, so the only, and it's worth noting that the only way we would get wavelength dependence is, a different, is if there's a difference between the absorption in the donor and the acceptor. Because whether or not we excite an electron in the donor and form this charge transfer state, or if we excite an electron in the acceptor, um, once the extra time diffusion happens and the charge is separated, this is the exact same state in both, in both cases. So once those charges are split, the, uh, the solar cell doesn't know any difference about it. Um, so, so any changes, any, any, uh, any wavelength dependence of the IQE, barring some special cases, um, should only result from the fact that excitons are not harvested as efficiently in one material versus the other. So the motivation for this, this method being uh, developed was that when you look in the literature, uh, all of the IQE spectra do not show wavelength uh, independence. They all have some kind of crazy signatures of the absorption spectrum of the cell. And this sort of indicates that something must be wrong with the way people are measuring the absorption of an active layer, because the external quantum efficiency is actually pretty easy to, to identify. Um, the big error that happens is that uh, people think the ITO, or all the transparent electrodes, and the metal reflective, the reflective metal contact are both lossless, like they're transparent so they don't absorb. And similarly, this is a metal contact, it's a really good mirror, so it reflects most of the light and we can just ignore the absorption of those materials. Um, but as you can see here, uh, this plot shows the total absorption of the device, the active layer absorption, and the parasitic absorption in these transparent electrodes. This parasitic absorption is actually pretty significant, ranging from 5% at the minimum up to as much as 35% in the areas where the active layer doesn't absorb very much. So it can't really be neglected. Um, furthermore, uh, another common misconception is that um, because of this metal contact, the light waves pass in and then they get reflected out. Um, so basically, a, a reasonable way to uh, measure the absorption would be to take the absorption of the films on a glass substrate and simply double the optical density because it's two paths. However, this does ignore interference effects. And like I said earlier, these devices are pretty thin and therefore, interference effects will matter because you only get uh, one or two interference peaks inside the whole cell's total thickness. Um, and because of uh, differences in the layers as you go up in the cell, the, the position of these peaks matters for the total absorption in the cell. So those effects cannot be neglected. The most common, or sorry, 
Um, it's also important that when actually measuring the absorption, that the measurement be taken inside of an integrating sphere and not simply measuring the spectral reflection of the device. This is often overlooked. Uh, the main reason is that despite um, the film's apparent uh, transparent optical qualities, there's actually a lot of scattering that goes on. So light that gets reflected off the, off of the back reflector um, doesn't uh, get scattered as it comes out. And so if you only measure the spectral reflection off the cell, you're only getting a small portion of the light that gets reflected off, and you'll overestimate the absorption of the cell. As shown in this graph, uh, the solid line shows what you'd measure if you only measured the spectral reflection, and the dashed line shows you the true <coughs> reflection curve when measured in the integrating sphere. Uh, so the most common, or the most effective method that people have used prior to this method to characterize the active layer absorption is to simply model it all in a computer program using optical constants for each layer and using a, a system of transfer matrices to characterize the reflection and transmission coefficients at each interface in the stack and also the absorption in each layer of the stack. Um, so it does take into account all the interfaces and the layers. It's, it's more accurate in that sense. Um, but it also requires precise knowledge of the optical constants, N and K. And um, this is difficult to do, uh, difficult to characterize for these anisotropic polymer films, uh, especially when the active layer is a blend of two different materials. Um, and because of that, um, the transfer matrix method, when used to predict uh, the total reflectance spectrum of a cell, does not accurately predict, predict that. It has a general shape, but there's extra features here that are not present in the cell. And you can imagine if you use this to determine IQE, you would, you would end up with wavelength dependence of the spectrum because of those inaccuracies. Um, and the main reason, are, or there's two main reasons, one, um, these indices of refraction vary with thickness in these polymer cells because of differences in materials as they're deposited on the substrate. There's vertical phase segregation. The phases uh, have different orientations and different domain sizes as they, as they progress up in the film. And also, uh, the surface is not perfectly planar. So there is the scattering I mentioned earlier. Um, and also, because of differences in thicknesses, um, the interference effects can kind of get washed out when you look at the bulk reflection properties. So what we determined to be the best way is kind of a, a mixture of the two, uh, a mixture of the best of both worlds. Because the active layer co um, composes most of the reflection, uh, the total absorption, sorry, we want to measure the total reflection experimentally and, and then simulate only the absorption in those parasitically absorbing transparent layers I measured earlier. And you can subtract those two um, to get a more accurate absorption spectrum for the material. As you can see, uh, because the active layer consists, oh, in the region of interest where the solar cell is producing most current, the active layer is doing most of the absorption. So by measuring the total absorption experimentally, we do capture most of those features in the active absorption. Um, and uh, if the error in the parasitic absorption that we model is small, um, it's correspondingly smaller when we subtracted from the experimentally measured total absorption. so that. If you had a 10% error in the parasitic absorption, it would result in roughly a 1% error in the, in the calculated active layer absorption, because the active layer absorption is typically 90% of the total absorption. Um, and to, as a demonstration of the robustness of this method, I've made two plots here on the right, showing um, what we would use if we used the method to calculate the active layer absorption using the true optical constants of the material in the, in the transfer matrix model. Um, to calculate those parasitic absorptions, and also just setting them all equal to n equals 2. Uh, and you can see that because most of the data is coming from the experimentally measured total absorption, it's very insensitive to errors in those optical constants, which are the things that are both hard to measure and also vary with, with depth in these films. Um, so this, this robustness allows um, for a lot more error in the measurement uh, without affecting the result. And the result is uh, we published the first wavelength independent IQB curves. Um, this plot shows uh, curves for both P3HG, PCBM, calcium chloroform, um, and at the time, the world record efficiency uh, materials, PCD-TBT, PC70BM, uh, calcium dichlorobenzene. 